history videos. But uh, rather than focusing on one particular person like we did most recently with Julius Caesar, or focusing on a big event like World War II or the Vietnam War, we're going to be taking a look at a sport, the history of football, how it began, how it developed. a cool, uh, a cool other like facet to history that we haven't yet done. Uh, I think it opens up uh, potential to do like history of the Olympics or of tennis or American football, whatever you guys want to see, do let me know. And as always, let me know what, uh, what time periods and events and people you want to see covered I, on my uh, spreadsheet with uh, video ideas. The history column is definitely the biggest. I've got ones like the Irish potato famine and the Irish rebellion and uh, the industrial revolution, the French revolution. Um, you know, so plenty to get through, but uh, football is the name of the game this evening. So we're going to take a look at um, the history of it, how it developed, and also take a look at uh, continent by continent how uh, century in the 
this century, games that resembled football were played on meadows and roads in England. Besides from kicks, the game involved also bunches of the ball with the fist. This early form of football was also much more rough and violent than the modern way of playing. An important feature of the forerunners to football was that the games involved plenty of people and took place over large areas in towns. An equivalent was played in Florence from the 16th century where it was called Calcio. The rampage of these games would cause damage on the town and sometimes death to the participants. These would be among the reasons for the proclamations against the game that finally was forbidden for several centuries. But the football-like games would return to the streets of London in the 17th century. It would be forbidden again in 1835. But at this stage, the game had been established in public schools. Well, modern football originated in Britain in the 19th century. Since before medieval times, folk football games had been played in towns and villages, according to local customs and with a minimum of rules. Industrialization and urbanization, which reduced the amount of leisure time and space available to the working class, combined with a history of legal prohibitions against particularly violent and destructive forms of folk football as we just discussed, undermined the game status from the early 19th century onward. However, football was taken up as a winter game between residents' houses at public schools such as Winchester, Charterhouse and Eden. Each school had its own rules. Some allowed limited handling of the ball and others did not. The variance in rules made it difficult for public school boys entering university to continue playing except with former schoolmates. As early as 1843, an attempt to standardise and codify the rules of play was made at the University of Cambridge, whose students joined most public schools in 1848 in adopting these so-called Cambridge Rules, which were further spread by Cambridge graduates who formed football clubs. In 1863, a series of meetings involving clubs from metropolitan London and surrounding counties produced the printed rules of football, which prohibited the carrying of the ball. Thus, the handling game of rugby remained outside the newly formed Football Association, or FA. Indeed, by 1870, all handling of the ball except by the goalkeeper was prohibited by the FA. The new rules were not universally accepted in Britain, however. Many clubs retained their own rules, especially in and around Sheffield. Although this northern English city was the home of the first provincial club to join the FA, in 1867 it also gave birth to the Sheffield Football Association, the forerunner of later county associations. Sheffield and London clubs played two matches against each other in 1866, and a year later, a match pitting a club from Middlesex against one from Kent and Surrey was played under the revised rules. In 1871, 15 FA clubs accepted an invitation to enter a cup competition and to contribute to the purchase of a trophy. By 1877, the associations of Great Britain had agreed upon a uniform code. Forty-three clubs were in the competition, and the London club's initial dominance had diminished. The development of modern football was closely tied to processes of industrialisation and urbanisation in Victorian Britain. Most of the new working-class inhabitants of Britain's industrial towns and cities gradually lost their old bucolic pastimes, such as badger baiting and sold fresh forms of collective leisure. From the 1850s onward, industrial workers were increasingly likely to have Saturday afternoons off work, and so many turned to the new game of football to watch or to play. Key urban institutions such as churches, trade unions and schools organised working class boys and men into recreational football teams. Rising adult literacy spurred press coverage of organised sports, while 
transport system such as the railways or urban trams enabled players and spectators to travel to football games. Average attendance in England rose from 4,618.88 to 7,918.95, rising to 13,290.05 and reaching 23,100 at the outbreak of World War I. Football's popularity eroded public interest in other sports, notably cricket. Leading clubs, notably those in Lancashire, started charging admission to spectators as early as the 1870s, and so, despite the FA's amateurism rule, were in a position to pay illicit wages to attract highly skilled working-class players, many of them hailing from Scotland. Working-class players and Northern English clubs sought a professional system that would provide, in part, some financial reward to cover their broken time, otherwise known as time lost from their other work, and the risk of injury. The FA remained staunchly elitist in sustaining a policy of amateurism that protected upper and upper middle class influence over the game. The issue of professionalism reached a crisis in England in 1884, when the FA expelled two clubs for using professional players. However, the payment of players had become so commonplace by then, that the FA had little option but to sanction the practice a year later, despite initial attempts to restrict professionalism to reimbursements for broken time. The consequence was that Northern clubs their large supporter bases and capacity to attract better players came to prominence. As the influence of working class players rose in football, the upper classes took refuge in other sports, notably cricket and rugby union. Professionalism also sparked further modernisation of the game through the establishment of the Football League, which allowed the leading dozen teams from the North and Midlands compete systematically against each other from 1888 onward. A lower second division was introduced in 1893, and the total number of teams increased to 28. The Irish and Scots formed leagues in 1890. The Southern League began in 1894, but was absorbed by the Football League in 1920. Yet football did not become a major profit-making business during this period. Professional clubs became limited liability companies, primarily to secure land for gradual development of stadium facilities. Most clubs in England were owned and controlled by businessmen, but shareholders received very low, if any, dividends. Their main reward was an enhanced public status through running the local club. Later, national leagues overseas followed the British model, which included league championships, at least one annual cup competition, and a hierarchy of leagues that sent clubs finishing highest in the tables up to the next higher division, and clubs at the bottom down to the lower one, i.e. relegation and promotion. A league was formed in the Netherlands in 1889, but professionalism only arrived in 1954. Germany completed its first national championship season in 1903, but the Bundesliga, a comprehensive and fully professional national league, did not evolve until 60 years later. In France, where the game was introduced in the 1870s, a professional league did not begin until 1932 shortly after professionalism had been adopted in the South American countries of Argentina and Brazil. By the early 20th century, football had spread across Europe, but it was in need of international organisation. A solution was found in 1904, when representatives from the football associations of Belgium, Denmark, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden and Switzerland founded the 
Federation International de Football Association, or FIFA. Although Englishman Daniel Walfall was elected FIFA president in 1906, and all of the home nations were admitted as members by 1911, British football associations were disdainful of the new body. FIFA members accepted British control over the rules of football via the International Board, which had been established by the home nations in 1882. Nevertheless, in 1920, the British associations resigned their FIFA memberships after failing to persuade other members that Germany, Austria and Hungary should be expelled following World War I. The British associations rejoined FIFA in 1924, but soon after insisted upon a very rigid definition of am amateurism, notably for Olympic football. Other nations again failed to follow their lead, and the British resigned once more in 1928, remaining outside FIFA until 1946. When FIFA established the World Cup Championship, British, British insouciance, insou what is that word, <laughs> toward the international game continued. Without membership in FIFA, the British national teams were not invited to the first three competitions, 1930, 34 and 38. For the next competition, held in 1950, FIFA ruled that the two best finishers in the British Home Nations tournament would qualify for World Cup play. England won, but Scotland, who finished second, chose not to compete for the World Cup, despite sometimes fractious international relations. Football continued to rise in popularity. It made its official Olympic debut at the London Games in 1908, and it has been played since in each of the Summer Games except for 1932 in LA. FIFA also grew steadily, especially in the latter half of the 20th century, when it strengthened its standing as the game's global authority and regulator of competition. Guinea became FIFA's 100th member in 1961, and at the turn of the 21st century, more than 200 nations were registered FIFA members, which is more than the number of countries that belong to the United Nations. The World Cup rem finals remain football's premier tournament, but other important tournaments have emerged under FIFA guidance. Two different tournaments for young players began in 1977 and 1985, and these became, respectively, the World Youth Championship for those 20 years old and younger. 17 World Championship. But so, the World Indoor Five Aside Championship started in 1989. Two years later, the first Women's World Cup was played in China. In 1992, FIFA opened the Olympic football tournament to players aged 23. And four years later, the first Women's Olympic football tournament was held. The World Club Championship debut in 2000, and the Under-19 Women's World Championship was inaugurated in 2002. FIFA membership is open to all national associations. They must accept FIFA's authority, observe the laws of football, and possess a suitable football infrastructure. FIFA's statute require members to form continental confederations. The first of these Confederación Sudamérica de Football, commonly known as CONMEBOL, was founded in South America in 1916. In 1954, the Union of European Football Associations, or UEFA, and the Asian Football Confederation, or AFC, were established. Africa's governing body, the Confederation Africaine de Football, or CAF, was founded in 1957. Federation of North, Central American and Caribbean Association of Football, or CONCACAF, followed four years later, and the o Oceania Football Confederation appeared in 1960.
and transfers is also problematic. In UEFA countries, players move freely when not under contract. On other continents, notably Africa and Central and South America, players tend to be tied into long-term contracts with clubs that can control their entire careers. FIFA now requires all agents to be licensed and to pass written examinations held by national associations, but there is little global consistency regarding the control of agent powers. In Europe, agents have played a key role in promoting wage inflation and higher player mobility. In Latin America, players are often partially owned by agents who may decide on whether transfers proceed. In parts of Africa, some European agents have been compared to slave traders in the way that they exercise authoritarian control over players and profit hugely from transfer fees to Western leagues with very little thought for their clients' well-being. In this way, the ever-widening inequalities between developed and developing nations are reflected in the uneven growth and variable regulations of world football. So we'll now take a look at football around the world, taking a look at the individual continents, beginning with Europe. So England and Scotland had the first leagues, but clubs sprang up in most European nations in the 1890s and 1900s, enabling these nations to found their own leagues. Many Scottish professional players migrated south to join English clubs, introducing English players and audiences to more advanced ball-playing skills and to the benefits of teamwork and passing. Up to World War II, the British continued to influence football's development through regular club tours overseas and the continental coaching careers of formal players. Itinerant Scots were particularly prominent in Central Europe. The interwar Danubian school of football emerged from the coaching legacies and expertise of John Madden in Prague and Jimmy Hogan in Austria. Before World War II, Italian, Austrian, Swiss and Hungarian teams emerged as particularly strong challenges to the British. During the 1930s, Italian clubs and the Italian national team recruited high-caliber players from South America, mainly Argentina and Uruguay, often claiming that these rimpatriati were essentially Italian in nationality. The great Argentinians, Raimondo Orsi and Enrique Caeta, were particularly useful acquisitions. But only after World War II was the preeminence of the home nations unquestionably usurped by overseas teams. In 1950, England lost to the United States at the World Cup Finals in Brazil. Most devastating were later crushing losses to Hungary, 6-3 in 1953 at London's Wembley Stadium, then 7-1 in Budapest a year later. The magical Magyars opened English eyes to the dynamic attacking and tactically advanced football played on the continent, and to the technical superiority of players such as Bushkas, Boschnik, and Nando Ideguti. During the 1950s and 60s, Italian and Spanish clubs were the most active in the recruitment of top foreign players. For example, the Welshman John Charles, known as the Gentle Giant, remains a hero for supporters of the Juventus Club of Turin, Italy, while the later success of Real Madrid was built largely on the play of Argentinian de Stefano and the Hungarian Puskas. European football has also reflected the wider political, economic and cultural changes of modern times. Heightened nationalism and xenophobia have pervaded matches often as a harbinger of future hostilities. During the 1930s, international matches in Europe were often seen as national tests of physical and military capability. In contrast, 
football's early post-World War II boom with this massive, well-behaved crowds that coincided with Europe's shift from warfare to rebuilding projects and greater internationalism. More recently, racism became a more prominent feature of football, particularly during the 70s and early 80s. Many coaches projected negative stereotypes onto black players, Supporters routinely abused non-whites on and off the fields of play, and football authorities failed to counteract racist incidents at games. In general terms, racism at football reflected wider social problems across Western Europe. In post-communist Eastern Europe, economic decline and rising nationalist sentiments have marked football culture too. The tensions that exploded in Yugoslavia's civil war shadow during a match in May 1990 between Serbian side Red Star Belgrade and the Croatian team Dynamo Zagreb, when violence involving rival supporters and Serbian riot police spread to the pitch to include players and coaches. Club football reflects the distinctive political and cultural complexities of European regions. In Britain, partisan football has been traditionally associated with the industrial working class, notably in cities such as Glasgow, Liverpool, Manchester and Newcastle. In Spain, clubs such as FC Barcelona and Athletic Bilbao are symbols of strong nationalist identity for Catalans and Basque, respectively. In France, many clubs have facilities that are open to the local community and reflect the nation's corporatist politics and being jointly owned and administered by private investors and local governments. In Italy, clubs such as Fiorentina, Inter Milan, SSE Napoli and AS Roma embody deep senses of civic and regional pride that predate Italian unification in the 19th century. The dominant forces in European national football have been Germany, Italy and latterly France. Their national teams have won a total of seven World Cups and six European Championships. Success in club football has been built largely on recruitment of the world's leading players, notably by Italian and Spanish sides. The European Cup competition for National League champions, first played in 1955, was initially dominated by Real Madrid. Other regular winners have been AC Milan, Bayern Munich, Ajax and Liverpool. The UEFA Cup, first contested as the Fairs Cup in 1955-58, has had a wider pool of entrants and winners. Since the late eight, uh, 1980s, top flight European football has generated increasing financial revenues from higher ticket prices, merchandise sales, sponsorships, advertising, and in particular, television contracts. The top professionals and largest clubs have been the principal beneficiaries. UEFA has reinvented the European Cup as the Champions League, allowing the wealthiest clubs freer entry and more matches. In the early 1990s, Belgian player Jean-Marc Bosman sued the Belgian Football Association challenging European football's traditional rule that all transfers of players necessitate an agreement between the clubs in question, usually involving a transfer fee. Bosman had been prevented from joining a new club by his old club. In 1995, the European courts upheld Bosman's complaint and had a stroke uncontracted European players to move between clubs without transfer fees. The bargaining power of players was strengthened greatly, enabling top stars to multiply their earnings with large salaries and signing bonuses. Warnings of the end of European football's financial boom came when FIFA's marketing agent ISL went bust in 2001. Such major media investors in football the Kurt Group in Germany and IDV Digital in the United Kingdom collapsed a year later. Inevitably, the 
financial boom had exacerbated inequalities within the game, widening the gap between the top players, the largest clubs, and the wealthiest spectators, and their counterparts in lower leagues, and the developing world. We now move to North and Central America and the Caribbean. So football was brought to North America in the 1860s, and by the mid-1880s informal matches had been contested by Canadian and American teams. It soon faced competition from other sports, including variant forms of football. In Canada, Scottish emigres were particularly prominent in the game's early development. However, Canadians subsequently turned to ice hockey as their national sport. In the United States, gridiron football emerged early in the 20th century as the most popular sport, but beyond elite universities and schools. Soccer was played widely in some cities with large immigrant populations, such as Philadelphia, Chicago, Cleveland, Ohio, and St. Louis, Missouri, as well as New York and LA after Hispanic migrations. The US Soccer Federation, formed in 1913, affiliated with FIFA and sponsored competitions. Between the World Wars, the United States attracted schools of European immigrants who played football for local teams, sometimes sponsored by companies. Football in Central America struggled to gain a significant foothold in competition against baseball. In Costa Rica, the Football Federation founded the National League Championship in 1921, but subsequent development in the region was slower, with a belated FIFA membership for countries such as El Salvador in 1938, Nicaragua in 1950, and Honduras in 1951. In the Caribbean, football traditionally failed in popularity to cricket in former British colonies. In Jamaica, football was highly popular in urban townships, but it did not capture the imagination of the country until 1998, when the national team, featuring several players who had gained success in Britain and were dubbed the Reggae Boys, qualified for the World Cup Finals. North American leagues and tournaments saw an infusion of professional players in 1967, beginning with the wholesale importation of foreign teams to represent American cities. The North American Soccer League formed a year later, and struggled until the New York Cosmos signed the Brazilian superstar Pele in 1975. Other international stars soon followed, and crowds grew to European proportions, but a regular fan base remained elusive and NASL folded in 1985. An indoor football tournament founded in 1978 evolved into a league and flourished for a while but collapsed in 1992. In North America, football did establish itself as the relatively less violent alternative to gridiron football and as a more socially inclusive sport for women. It is particularly popular among college and high school students across the US. After hosting an entertaining World Cup Finals in 1994, the United States possess some 16 million football players nationwide, up to 40% of whom were female. In 1996, a new attempt at establishing a professional outdoor league was made. Major League Soccer, or MLS, was more modest in ambition than NASL, being originally played in only 10 US cities, with greater emphasis on local players and a relatively tight salary cap. The MLS proved to be the most successful American soccer league, expanding to 20 teams, including two from Canada, by 2016, while also signing a number of lucrative broadcasting teams with American television networks and some star players from European leagues. The United States hosted and won the Women's World Cup Finals in 1999, attracting enthusiastic local support. The 
success of the MLS and the Women's World Cup led to the creation of a Women's Professional League in 2001. The Women's United Soccer Association, or WUSA, began with eight teams and featured the world star player, Mia Hamm, but it disbanded in 2003. North American National Associations are members of the continental body, CONCACAF, and Mexico is the traditional regional powerhouse. Mexico has won the CONCACAF Gold Cup four times since it was first contested in 1991, and Mexican clubs have dominated the CONCACAF Champions, Champions Cup for clubs since it began in 1962. British influence in mining and railroads encouraged the founding of football clubs in Mexico in the late 19th century. A national league was established in 1903. Mexico is exceptional in that its mass preference for football runs counter to the sporting tastes of its North American neighbours. The national league system is the most successfully, su commercially successful in the region attracts players from all over the Western Hemisphere. Despite high summer humidity and stadiums at high elevations, Mexico has hosted two of the most memorable World Cup finals in 1970 and 1986, from which Brazil and Argentina, led by the game's then greatest players Pelé and Maradona respectively, emerged as the respective winners. While the national team has been ranked highly by FIFA, often figuring in the top 10, Mexico initially did not produce the world-class calibre of players expected of such a large football-crazed nation. Hugo Sanchez of Real Madrid was the only Mexican player to reach the highest world level in the 20th century, but the 21st saw a number of Mexican standouts excel with top European clubs. We now move down further to South America. Football first came to South America in the 19th century through the port of Buenos Aires, Argentina, where European sailors played the game. The members of the British community there formed the first club, the Buenos Aires Football Club, in 1867. About the same time, British railway workers started another club in the town of Rosario, Argentina. The first Argentinian League Championship was played in 1893, but most of the players belonged to the British community, a pattern that continued until the early 20th century. Brazil is believed to be the second South American country where the game was established. Charles Miller, a leading player in England, came to Brazil in 1894 and introduced football in Sao Paulo. That city's athletic club was the first to take up the sport. In Colombia, British engineers and workers building a railroad near Barraquilla first played football in 1903, and the Barraquilla FBC was founded in 1909. In Uruguay, British railway workers were the first to play, and in 1891 they founded the Central Uruguay Railway Cricket Club now the famous Peñarol, which played both cricket and football. In Chile, British sailors initiated play in Valparaíso, establishing the Valparaíso FC in 1889. In Paraguay, Dutchman William Barthes introduced the game at a school where he taught PE. But the country's first and still leading club, Olympia, was formed by a local man who became enthusiastic after seeing the game in Buenos Aires in 1902. In Bolivia, the first footballers were a Chilean and then students who had studied in Europe, and in Peru they were expatriate Britons. In Venezuela, British miners are known to have played football in the 1880s. Soon, local people across South America began taking up and following the sport in ever greater numbers. Boys, mostly from poorer backgrounds, played from an early age, with passion on vacant land and streets. Clubs and players gained popularity and professionalism entered the sport in most countries around the 1930s, although many players had been paid secretly before then by their clubs. 
exodus of South American players to European clubs that paid higher salaries began after the 1930 World Cup and has steadily increased. By the late 1930s, football had become a crucial aspect of popular culture in many South American nations. Ethnic and national identities were constructed and played out on an increasingly international stage. In South American nations, non-white players fought a successful struggle to play at the top level. In Rio de Janeiro, Vasco da Gama was the first club to recruit black players and promptly stormed the league championship in 1923, encouraging other clubs to follow suit. Uruguay, a nation of largely mixed European descent, local players learned both the physical style played by the English and the more refined passing game of the Scots, producing a versatility that helped their national team win two Olympic championships and the World Cup between 1924 and 1930. In 1916, South American countries were the first to hold a regular continental championship, later known as the Copa America. In 1960, the South American Club Championship, or Libertadores Cup, was started. It has been played annually by the continent's leading clubs, with the winner playing the European Club Champion. And as a result of its popularity, various other international competitions also been held between clubs. Domestic league championships are split into two or more tournaments each season with frequent variations in format. Next continent is Africa. So, European sailors, soldiers, traders, engineers and missionaries brought football with them to Africa in the second half of the 19th century. The first documented match took place in Cape Town in 1862, after which the game spread rapidly through the continent, particularly in the British colonies and in societies with vibrant indigenous athletic traditions. During the interwar period, African men in cities and towns, railroad workers and students organised clubs, associations and regional competitions. From Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia competed in the North African Championship, established in 1919, and vied for the North African Cup, introduced in 1930. South of the Sahara, Kenya and Uganda first played for the Kosage Trophy in 1924, and the Daruga Cup was established on the island of Zanzibar. In the mining centre of Elizabethville, now Lum Lubumbashi, Congo, a football league for Africans was started in 1925. In South Africa, the game was very popular by the early 1930s, though it was organised in racially segregated national associations for whites, Africans, coloureds and Indians. In the colonies of British West Africa, the Gold Coast, now Ghana, launched its first national football association in 1922, with Nigeria's southern capital of Lagos following suit in 1931. Enterprising clubs and leagues developed across French West Africa in the 1930s, especially in Senegal and the Ivory Coast. Moroccan forward Larbi Ben Barek became the first African professional in Europe, playing for Olympique de Marseille and the French national team in 1938. After World War II, football in Africa experienced dramatic expansion. Modernising colonial regimes provided new facilities and created attractive competitions, such as the French West Africa Cup in 1947. The migration of talented Africans to European clubs intensified. Together with his older compatriot Mario Colunia, Mozambican sensation Eusebio, European Player of the Year in 1965, starred for European champions Benfica of Lisbon.
Lisbon and led Portugal to third place in the 1966 World Cup, where he was the tournament's leading scorer. Algerian stars Rashid Makluthi of Saint Etienne and Mustafa Zidouni of AS Monaco represented France before joining the team of the Algerian Liberation Front in 1958. The FLN-11, who lost only four of 58 matches during the period 1958-62, embodied the close relations between nationalist movements and football in Africa on the eve of decolonization. With colonialism's hold on Africa slipping away, Confederation African de Football, or CAF, was established in February 1957 in Sudan, with the first African Cup of Nations tournament also played at that time. Independent African states encouraged football as a means of forging a national identity and generating international recognition. In the 60s and early 70s, African football earned a reputation for a spectacular attacking style of play. African and European coaches emphasised craft, creativity and fitness within solid but flexible tactical schemes. Salif Keita of Mali, Laurent Bocou of the Ivory Coast and Francois Mbele of Congo personify the dynamic qualities of football in post-colonial Africa. In the late 1970s, the migration of talented players overseas began hampering domestic leagues. The effects of this player exodus were somewhat tempered by the rise of scientific football and defensive risk-averting tactics, an international trend that saw African players fall out of favour with European clubs. Even so, the integration of Africa and Africans into world football accelerated in the 1980s and 90s. Cameroon's national team, known as the Indomitable Lions, was a driving force in this process. After being eliminated without losing a match at the 1982 World Cup in Spain, Cameroon reached the quarterfinals of the 1990 World Cup in Italy, therefore catapulting African football into the global spotlight. Nigeria then captured the Olympic gold medal in men's football at the Summer Games in Atlanta in 1996. In 2000, Cameroon won its first Olympic gold medal in men's football at the Games in Sydney, Australia. Success also came at youth level as Nigeria and Ghana claimed under-17 world titles. Moreover, Liberian striker George Weah of Paris Saint-Germain received the prestigious FIFA World Player of the Year Award in 1995. In recognition of Africans football, African football success and influence, FIFA awarded Africa five places in the 32-team 1998 World Cup Finals. This achievement bears witness to African football's phenomenal passion, growth and development. This rich and complex history is made more remarkable by the continent's struggles to cope with a fragile environment, scarce material resources, political complex, and the unpleasant legacy of imperialism. And to finish of this history, we now travel, of course, last but not least, to Asia and Oceania. So football quickly ended Asia and Oceania in the latter half of the 19th century, but unlike in Europe, it failed to become a unifying national sport. In Australia, it could not dislodge the winter games of Australian rules football, codified before soccer and rugby. British immigrants to Australia did relatively little to develop football locally, because Southern European immigrants were more committed to founding clubs and tournaments, football became defined as an ethnic game. As a result, teams from Melbourne and Sydney with distinctive Mediterranean connections were the most prominent members. 
members of the National Soccer League, or NSL, when it started in 1977. The league has widened its scope, however, to include a highly successful Perth side, plus a Brisbane club and even one from Auckland, New Zealand. The NSL collapsed in 2004, but a new league known as the A-League emerged the next year. New Zealand, Scottish players established clubs and tournaments from the 1880s, but rugby became the national passion. In Asia during the same germinal period, British traders, engineers and teachers set up football clubs such as in such colonial outposts as Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore. its failure to establish substantial roots among indigenous peoples beyond college students returning from Europe. Football in India was particularly prominent in Calcutta among British soldiers, but locals soon adopted cricket. In Japan, Yokohama and Kobe housed large numbers of football-playing foreigners, but local people retained preferences for the traditional sport sumo wrestling and the imported game of baseball. At the turn of the 21st century, football became increasingly important in Asian societies. In Iran, national team football matches became opportunities for many to express their reformist political views, as well as for broad public celebration. The Iraqi men's team's fourth place finish at the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens struck a chord of hope for their war-torn homeland. The Asian game is organised by the Asian Football Confederation, comprising 46 members in 2011 and stretching geographically from Lebanon in the Middle East to Guam in the Western Pacific Ocean. The Asian Cup for national teams has been held quadrennially since 1956. Iran, Saudi Arabia and Japan have dominated, with South Korea a regular runner-up. These countries have also produced the most frequent winners of the annual Asian Club Championship, first contested in 1967. Asian economic growth during the 1980s and early 1990s and greater cultural ties to the West helped club football. Japan's J-League was launched in 1993, attracting strong public interest and a sprinkling of famous foreign players and coaches, notably from South America. Attendance and revenue declined from 1995, but the league survived and was reorganised into two divisions of 16 and 10 clubs respectively by 1999. by 2005 but had reduced to 18 by 2018. Some memorable international moments have indicated the potential of football in Asia and Oceania. Asia's first notable success was North Korea's stunning defeat of Italy at the 1966 World Cup Finals. In 1994, Saudi Arabia became the first Asian team to qualify for the World Cup second round. 2002 World Cup hosted by Japan and South Korea, and the on-field success of the host nation's national teams. South Korea reached the semis and Japan reached the second round, stood as the region's brightest accomplishment in international football. Football's future in Asia and Oceania depends largely upon regular competition with top international teams and players. Increased representation in the World Cup Finals has helped development of the sport in the region. Meanwhile, domestic club competitions across Asia and Oceania have been weakened by the need for top national players to join better clubs in Europe or South America to test and improve their talents at a markedly higher level. One promising development for the continent came in 2010 when Qatar was announced as the host. 22 World Cup, which was the first World Cup to be held in the Middle East. And that, my friends,
video.